Hi, this is Ron Sipsik. In this particular segment, we're going to take a look at the choice to invest. And what makes the investment problem interesting is that the costs are incurred in the present, but the returns are spread out in the future. So you cannot compare future returns to present costs because a dollar in the future does not equal a dollar in the present. We learned about this in our time value of money principles, that a dollar today does not equal a dollar in the future. So in order to compare future returns, these, these R's here that we see in time period one, two, and three, in order to compare future returns to present cost, cost is incurred in the present, we need to discount or somehow take these future returns and convert them back into their present value. So we cannot compare a present cost to a future value. We can compare a present cost to a future return that has been translated back into its present value. Now, what do we mean by a return? A return will be of two, there's two basic types of returns in the business world. There's, uh, if we recall, if you take total, total revenue and subtract total cost, you get something called total profit. Anything that enhances revenue or decreases cost will improve profit. So these returns that we're looking at are going to be of, of two varieties. Either they will be uh, returns where revenues have been enhanced or there'll be cases where costs have been reduced. And that's the purpose of investment, basically. Purpose of investment, say investment in a building, new building, or a new piece of machinery, or a new piece of office equipment, or maybe a new vehicle, or perhaps a new type of technology. These investments are either designed to raise revenues or reduce costs or to do both. Either way, if we enhance revenues or reduce costs, we boost profits. So these are really increases in profit. This is plus 1,000, plus 1,000, plus 1,000. Now, let's set the problem up. What this problem says is the firm is willing to consider incurring a present cost in time zero to generate three future returns. Notice, though, that these returns are stretched out over three years. What we're assuming here is that the project no longer has a useful life beyond three, three years. So the project is no longer effective in generating these returns past three years. Or the equipment somehow wears out or becomes obsolete. That's another way of saying it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be comparing few, three future returns to a present value cost. Now what makes this problem tricky is that a dollar in the future is not worth a dollar in hand today. So we have to discount these future returns at a given interest rate. Let's assume for the sake of argument that the going interest rate is R equals 3%. Let's say that the real rate of return on either borrowed money or money taken out of a savings account is 3%. Either way we're borrowing. If we borrow money from a bank at 3% as a company, that's really the very same thing as taking money out of a savings account that's earning 3%. Either way, we're lo losing 3% on that money. We have to pay out 3% on that money. You say, well, if we take it out of savings, we don't have to pay interest. In essence, we incur an opportunity cost. If we could have earned 3% interest on a savings account and we pulled a 2600 out of there, then we're no longer earning the 3% interest on the 2600 which means we've lost 3% interest on 2600. Now, how do we take a future value and move it back into the present, convert it to a present value? Well, we have to divide the future value by its corresponding interest rate factor. If the interest rate is 3%, this interest rate factor will be 1.03 to the what? To the first power, because this return is one year out. This return is two years out, so it would be 1,000 divided by 1.03 squared to the second power, and this would be 1,000 divided by 1.03 cubed. 
So to return these present values, future values, back into their present value, we need to discount them at the using the proper interest rate factor. So this number, whatever it is, will come back one year. This number will come back two years. And this number will come back three years. We're assuming these returns are earned at the end of the period, which is unrealistic. They could The $1,000 return is very likely to be earned throughout the year, but we'll assume that they're earned at the end of the period to make the discounting process simple. Now, if you take if you take $1,000 and divide it by 1.03, you're going to get a present value of 970.87. So 970.87 in hand today is equal to $1,000 one year from now. If you take $1,000 two years from now, discount it back to the present, you're going to get a number less than 970. And in fact, it's 942.60. So we talked about this in our time value of money lesson, that the further you push money into the future, the lower its present value. And then, of course, we continue with this theme. If we take $1,000 three years out and bring it back three years to its present value, we get 9, 15, 14. And again, the principle applies that the further the $1,000 is out into the future, the less its present value. Now, if we add up these three PVs, let me just move this aside here. This is, this is PV, this is PV benefit one. This is PV benefit 2, and this is PV benefit 3. We can add up those present value benefits, and I get $2,828.61. Okay? So what do we see? We see that if we discount the $3,000, this is $3,000 over three years, but if we discount it back, into its present value dollars, it's really worth 282861. Okay? Now, the, 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 the story doesn't end here. We're, we need to subtract the present value benefits, have to subtract from the present value benefits the present value costs. And this project costs $2,600. So does this project pay? That's the question. Let's Let's see. I, I don't like this. Let me get rid of this red line because we want to do this nice. So this is a black line. And so what, what's the difference here? The difference is actually plus $2,028.61. So in fact, this project is a go. Why? because the PV benefit is greater than the PV cost. So if you take the PV benefit and you subtract the PV cost, what do you get? You get something called the net present value. The net present value, or what is generally abbreviated as NP, NPO. Now, if the NPO is positive, it's a go. So if the net present value is greater than zero, then then the project is a go. If the net present value is less than zero, then the project. I'm having a hard time writing today. My hand is not listening to my head. So it's writing things that I don't want it to write. Okay, hand behave. If NPV is less than zero, then the project is a no-go. It's that simple. So it's, it's again, a, a, a case of marginal analysis. We take the, the benefit, we compare it to the cost, 
and we do, and we make the decision to to do something, the choice to do something, and whether the benefit is greater than or equal to or less than the cost. In this case, the PV benefit is greater than the PV cost. So in this case, the choice would be to invest in this particular in this particular project. Okay. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to I'd like to run this at a different interest rate, and I'll show you a very interesting result. Okay, so let's go ahead and set the problem up again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this up a little bit, and we'll, we'll skip some of the, the labeling here to make this go a little faster. So here's T0, here's T1, here's T2, here's T3, plus 1,000 in each of these three years. Again, this is either cost reduction or revenue enhancement. Either way, profits are going up by a thousand. It's expected that profits will go up by a thousand. I'm going to assume that R is not 3%, but R is 9%. So what if the interest rate is 9%, not 3%? We're going to divide this by 1.09 to the first power. Divide this by 1.09 to the second power. Again, what we're doing is we're dividing the future value by the interest rate factor to bring these numbers back to their present value. 1.09 to the third power. So if we bring this number back, if we bring this number back, and we bring this number back, we can get the PV benefit. Okay, I just happen to have these. So what are the PV benefits? This will be 917.43. Notice that these PV benefits are, are lower. They're all lower. Why? Because we're using a higher interest rate. If you discount at a higher interest rate, you're saying the time value of money problem is more acute, that lenders are expecting a higher interest rate to give up a dollar today and not spend it. So when you use a higher interest rate, everything else held constant, the PVs will be relatively small. When you use a relatively low interest rate, the PVs will be relatively large. So let me just go ahead and write these out for you. 772.18. And if we go, out, go ahead and add together these PV benefits, we actually get a much lower number, 25 31 and 29 cents. This is our PV benefit. We have not changed our PV cost. We're holding our PV cost constant. Our PV cost, let me move this aside a little bit, is minus 2600. This is our PV present value cost. And so if we then go to calculate, we see we're in the red on this project. That in fact, PV benefit minus PV cost is a minus 6871. And what do we have? We have an NPV less than zero. Therefore, the project, as I said earlier, is a no-go. It would not pay to do this project. Okay? So what we see here is a very important principle. As interest rates increase, as interest rates increase, an increase in the interest rate, the real rate of interest leads to what? A decrease in the rate of investment. We're less likely to invest at higher interest rates. However, if real interest rates are relatively low, businesses are more likely to invest. So this is a very, very important business principle. Interest rates have a profound effect on investment decision making because they alter the time value of money equation. The higher the interest rate, the greater the returns have to be. The higher the interest rate, the greater the future returns have to be to be high enough to exceed the cost. However, if interest rates are very low, those future returns don't have to be as high for the investment to be a go. We can actually draw this. So let's go ahead and do that. 
I'm going to show you the investment demand curve. And uh, you go, oh, you've got to be kidding me. There's a demand curve for investment. Folks, there's a demand curve for just about everything. Not everything, but just about everything. Now, be careful what we're doing here. I'm going to show you something here. There's a, there is a little trick to this. So this is the interest rate. This is R. This is not a dollar amount. This is a percentage. Usually it's an annual percentage. This rate of investment down here, I'm going to put I down here. This is actually measured in dollars. So we're, we're using a little bit different scheme here. We're using percentage on the price axis, and we're using dollars, we're using dollars on the quantity axis. So let's go ahead and let's look at this. If the interest rate is relatively low, the interest rate is relatively low, say that R1 equals 3%, the investment rate will be relatively high, I1. If the interest rate is relatively high, this is 1, this is 2, let's say the interest rate is at 9%, then in this case the investment this firm invests less. They don't undertake the project we just evaluated. So higher interest rates lead to what? Lower investment. This is, folks, this is the law of demand. Now applied to investment decision making. So we can call this the demand for investment. The demand for investment curve. Okay? Well, if we had more time and and you had more energy, and I wasn't so hungry, we would continue here. But this is a good place to stop, and so we will. Again, the idea here is the, the effective interest rates on the rate of investment. Low interest rates, higher likelihood of investment. High interest rates, lower likelihood of investment.